I want to call uh, the State and Local and Veterans Committee back to order. It is oh, 5.56 or so. Uh, we are uh, taking up uh, Senate File 73, which I am going to take up from the table now. Uh, and we can continue uh, uh, this uh, deliberation. Senator Port, well, welcome back to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as we uh, went into recess, we had just completed uh, adding the uh, Senate, excuse me, the amendment, the A100. Um, I understand that you have a few more amendments that you want to add. Uh, and so we should proceed with that work. Uh, and then we'll move uh, from there into committee discussion, committee debate. Sounds good. Uh, Madam Chair, then I have the A102. All right. Senator uh, Port has the A102. I'll move the A102. Uh, we're going to get that distributed um, for our members. We have, uh, I think, three members who are with us now virtually this evening. Um, for those of you that are virtual, do you want to check in while this amendment is being uh, distributed? I think I have Senator McQuaid, Senator Morrison, Senator Lang. Hi there, Senator Lang. <laughs> good evening, Madam Chair. It's sunny out there. It's good. Yeah. All right. I am uh, in Minnesota for the next, during the committee hearing, let's say. All right. Senator Morrison. Currently in St. Paul, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Morrison. We'll come back to Senator McQuaid. All right, we have the 102, Senate file, excuse me, the amendment, the A102. Senator Port, do you want to describe this for us? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in the Transportation Committee, we had an amendment offered by Senator Coleman um, regarding the retirement of the of drug dogs and that they be have an opportunity to for their handlers to adopt them if they were retired. Uh, this just has cleanup language from the administration on how the actual handling of that would go. So does uh, just uh, it sort of lays out what would happen if the handler does not want uh, the canine and what the agency with ownership would do after that. Thank you, Senator Port. Are there questions? Members, are there questions uh, for Senator Port? Seeing no further questions, then uh, all those in favor of the A102, please say aye. 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 And those opposed, please say no. And the A102 is adopted. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, then I would like to move the A101. Thank you, Senator Port. We will get that distributed to members. Did you want to describe it as it's being distributed? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The A101 was um, suggested language from council that is uh, typical in setting up a new agency, a new council, like the advisory council, so that it puts uh, the members of the council not all on the same appointment schedule uh, or, or, I guess, the end of their appointment schedule. Um, so it staggers their terms. Uh, this was on advice of council. Thank you, Senator Port. I'm gonna wait till members all have the amendment. Senator Point Port has described the A101. It is an amendment uh, advised by council to make sure terms are staggered on the advisory council. Members, do you have questions? Madam Chair. Senator Coran. Senator Port, um, you know, I, I was going through the uh, advisory council and how many members are on there? Senator Port. 50 plus. Is, is, has anybody seen an effective organization with more than 10 advisory 
people, Every, members, or any uh, any highly functioning advisory board, or in any capacity and function uh, in the real world that operates effectively with 50 plus people. And I think we talked about it a little bit before in our in a call. What I always get concerned about is how do we make sure we've had citizen appointments? It appears that there's no average citizen has an interest that everybody always has a special interest. And my biggest concern is is, is around that for this entire board. Um, we don't see, in, in fact, at the table today, we see members of one organization pushing this for their own profiting. We don't see the average, we don't see a random opinion. I'm sure there's testifiers who would like to up, be up there and co-opinion co every statement or every question of the, of the bill as we move forward. And I'm worried about how does this board function? How do we make sure it sounds like they're going to guide everything? Um, it has broad rulemaking jurisdiction um, in every aspect of the program, and of every aspect, they're just one component a component from the advisory. But how do we how do we know that it's a, a citizen that's not already tied to some nonprofit, some you know, a diverse thought? I guess that's what I'm looking for. How can we guarantee diverse thought in something like that? Because I haven't seen anything in the last couple of years where any of these committees have diverse thought. And to me, it's important that we do that. And I'm just struggling that 150 members isn't going to allow you to do anything effectively. But how do we get diverse thought in this process? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Coran. Um, part of that certainly is part of the goal of um, a large advisory council is that this bill and the agency will be incredibly varied, uh, the work that they do and the rules that they make. Some of them will be related to farming practices, agricultural practices. Some of the rulemaking will be around um, you know, business licenses and things like that. So we wanted to make sure with the advisory council that there were experts from the different fields that will be called on. Um, I, we talked about this the other day. I think we often hunger for the voices of real people um, mm -hmm. to be in um, both in, in these halls, but also in our governing. Um, and so that's something I'm happy to continue working with you. Um, but I also, you know, as soon as we say there's six uh, citizen spots, I think you and I both know that those would be chomped up pretty fast by the people who are watching these bills and know how to get their people on them, things like that. Um, but, but I do think part of the diversity of opinion is that there are a lot of different areas of expertise uh, that we have put on the council because it will have to span a bunch of areas. I don't expect that all 50 people would make an advisory opinion on agricultural best practices, but the agricultural experts and farmers that we have on there would lead those discussions. Um, you know, I think that's that's the reasoning behind uh, it, the the strength of the Madam, advisory board. Madam Chair and Senator Port, yeah, Senator and, and I Curran. agree. But as many of the testifiers before, they feel left out already, and they're already in the industry. And so, how do you keep, how do you include them? One, they haven't been included. The change, there's no changes that are going to enable the uh, the the cannab or the uh, hemp market as it is today to exist in any functional way. At least that's uh, everybody I've talked to doesn't believe that. So how do we bring them those diverse opinions? Because amazing diversity in that group. Just yeah. I don't see any diverse, diversity of opinions. So um, we need to do that because, my God, the, we had, before this legislative session started, I think there were 130 different committees, advisory course, task force, and commissions. Um, we're going to add hundreds more in, in people that are in influential roles that are unelected and likely don't share much diversity in thought. And that's my biggest concern. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what I will say, specific, particularly to the um, hemp provisions that were brought up by a testifier earlier, um, this the amendment does untangle those uh, and provides for essentially a continuation of the current uh, industrial hemp process. Uh, we've worked with that with significant input from hemp farmers. Um, the particular uh, 
uh, dates that the testifier was uh, referencing uh, leave out that in section seven of this bill, there is a particular uh, sort of in the midst of that fix for that um, that allows for temporary licenses through that period of transition. Um, so I do believe that we have made the changes that the industrial hemp um, and hemp farmers have requested. Um, we've been in deep conversation with them for months. Thank you, Senator Port. Are there further questions on staggered terms? Uh, seeing no further questions, all those in favor of the A101, please say aye. 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 And those opposed say no. And the amendment is adopted. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have just one more. Um, this is uh, the A107, please. Thank you, Senator Port. The A107 will be distributed. It is before the committee. Uh, as it's being distributed, would you like to describe the amendment, please? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. The 107 um, is an additional step towards making sure that we are continue that we will continue to have um, a medical cannabis market that meets the needs of our medical patients. Uh, currently, in our sort of bulk processors licenses that are in the bill, which were, these are the people who would have 60,000 square feet or more, um, really large processors, um, don't have the ability to vertically integrate. They can't control all of their business from top to bottom. They can have a piece of it as a cultivator or as a um, processor, but not do everything top to bottom. The goal of that is to make sure that there are points of entry into um, the licenses, into this market for not just very, very wealthy national companies that already do that, who we don't want to come in and just run the Minnesota market. Um, however, we know that the medical market is significantly different and that the profit margin is different and people's desire to come into Minnesota and start up a medical cannabis program as we legalize adult rec is very unlikely. And we need to keep our medical uh, providers, medical cannabis providers, um, able to continue to do their business. Right now, those medical providers are allowed to be vert vertically integrated. So we are adding in that though they are on the top scale of what is allowable for growers, uh, because that's what's required to meet the need of our medical market, that in the medical portion, of their business, they are allowed to be vertically integrated. And that's what this amendment does. Thank you, Senator Port. Members, do you have questions on the A107? All right, seeing no further questions, uh, A107 before us. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And, those aye. Opposed, and those opposed say no. And that amendment is adopted. Senator Port, do you have other amendments? That is my last amendment, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Port. That means we will move next to member questions and discussion about the bill. Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm reflecting back on when uh, Mr. Neumeister was uh, talking about uh, ethics, transparency, and accountability, and no member of the board or office or any officer blah, 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 blah. Uh, and basically saying, you know, keep people off the, the board and off, off the uh, positions of the executive or of this organization, whatever it's going to be created. And uh, I thought that maybe it would be wise also to include the legislature in that. And so I'd like to offer the A108 amendment. Senator Anderson offers the A108. We'll get that distributed to members and to the bill's author. Uh, once we've got it, then we'll ask Senator Anderson to describe it with backup from council if we need to, and then we'll turn to you, Senator Port. Thank you. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the A108 basically says a person who has served in the legislature 
or in statewide office is not eligible to be appointed to the position of director of this uh, cannabis uh, legislation or the, the group that's been uh, formed uh, until five years after the end of a person's term in the legislature or statewide office. And uh, Madam Chair, I would like a roll call on this. Senator Anderson has uh, requested a roll call on the A108. No. That's all good. Uh, Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Anderson. Um, I am happy to accept this as a friendly amendment. Uh, this is something we've been discussing. It has been adopted, or similar language has been adopted in the other body, um, and I'm happy to take this as a friendly amendment. Thank you, Senator Port. Madam Senator Chair, Anderson. I'll withdraw my uh, roll call request. Senator I'm Anderson withdraws his roll call request. Members, other questions on the A108? And seeing no questions, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed Aye. say Aye. And those opposed say no. And the A108 is adopted. And Madam Chair. Senator also, Anderson. I also have another amendment that I would like to, on page 17 of the amendment, of the A, A98 amendment. Um, is this an oral amendment, Senator Anderson? Madam Chair, no, it's, a, it's the A11. A111 amendment. It also deals with what Rich Neumeister was asking for as far as transparency and accountability. And uh, on page 17, after the line 5, uh, insert or in a recipient of a grant under this chapter. And so it's to uh, basically make sure that uh, we aren't being conflicted by looking after more money through this bill uh, as we go forward and uh, people are asking for more money or grants to uh, be a part of this whole situation. So I'm just kind of reflecting what Mr. Neumeister had testified in committee and would like to see this uh, as a, uh, an addition to the bill. And unless uh, Senator Port is against this, uh, if she's for it, I'll take it as a friendly, but I'll, I'll ask for a roll call in, in advance. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Senator Anderson moves the A111 amendment. Uh, Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Senator Anderson, um, I'm happy to accept this as a friendly amendment as well. Okay. I'll withdraw my roll call on that, uh, Madam Chair, and I just hopefully meet the concerns of uh, some of the people that testified on behalf of the bill and hopefully uh, get this in a better shape of the bill that others are looking forward to seeing. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Uh, members, do you have questions on the A111 amendment? Then seeing no further questions, all those in favor of the A111, please aye. say aye. 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 And those opposed, please say no. And that amendment is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome, Senator Anderson. Are there further questions? Members. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Senator Port, for bringing the bill. Um, you know, Madam Chair, we continue to see bills come through this committee that aren't ready for prime time. This is this is one of them. Uh, I don't know that I've seen too many, if any, bills that um, are seem somewhat haphazard in their construction during the process. We, I, I think, the, I mean, we had some amendments that came before. I thought they were done, and then. We received some more, and um, we received an amendment that was 149 pages to a 250-page bill. And, I, Madam Chair, I, I, I mean, I think we should have an information hearing on this thing so that members truly understand what's in the bill and how it works. Um, there's a lot of bills we're working on right now, uh, the human capacity to read and understand uh, the provisions in this bill uh, truly is not here for any of us at the table here. It truly is not. Um, we've got um, uh, the uh, last section of the bill, section 9, I think it is, Madam Chair, um, that deals with the appropriations. And, you know, again, this is a fiscal committee, and I don't know how many bills have come before this committee, major bills, and we don't have any idea what the fiscal impact's going to be. The cart's before the horse. We're overrunning our headlights. We're, we're flying by the seat of our pants. We are engaging in legislative malpractice, Madam Chair. I counted 110 blanks 
on Article 9 of the bill where there's supposed to be numbers put in and they're supposed to dictate in the bill the amount of appropriation, the amount of money that is given to each of those areas in the bill, 110 of them. And they're all blank. And we're the committee that's supposed to make judgment on those numbers here today. And Madam Chair, this isn't the first time. I, I mean, the majority is in such a hurry to ram these bills through that we aren't doing a service to the people of Minnesota. That's my comments, Madam Chair. I, I don't know how you can, you, 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 you really, to, to be responsible to the people of Minnesota, the majority needs to shift out of fifth gear and get down at least second or third, especially on a bill like this. We should be in first gear on this bill, Madam Chair. That's where we should be. We're in high gear and overdrive right now. And I think we just ran over the people of Minnesota with the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Dreskowski. I, I do want to call our attention one more time to the documents that were distributed at the start. There is one provision in Article 9 that deals with an appropriation to the Department of Revenue that we will eventually see in a fiscal note. That's the only part uh, of this bill that has anything to do with Article 9 um, before this committee. But Senator Port, I am wondering if you would be willing to spend some time with us talking about the work that has been done not just in the session, but prior to the session uh, to bring this debate to the point that it's at. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair um, and members. There, you know, prior to this bill being drafted in its first iteration uh, several years ago, there was a statewide tour um, done by members of the House, uh, the other body, um, and uh, statewide across uh, in communities all over the place that held listening sessions to understand what communities across our state wanted and needed from a potential legalization bill. Those conversations and town halls um, that were went on for over a year um, and had significant input were the basis for where the bill started uh, with the people of Minnesota. Um, through that, and I will turn it over to um, my expert here as well, uh, the MN is Ready Coalition was also formed, um, which when you talk about a coalition coming together for a particular issue, um, I've worked a lot with a coalition on reproductive freedom as the Reproductive Freedom Caucus Chair. Um, those are the people on the ground who know the details of what is happening in Minnesotans' lives in regards to these issues. This cannabis bill is complex. Uh, it does take time and thought to understand the whole thing. Uh, and that is why a diverse coalition that represents everything from industrial hemp to medical patients to um, people who just want to be able to grow in their own homes to people who have been a part of the criminal justice system because of cannabis and what expungement means to their communities and their families, uh, social justice and equity as a part of it. It is not a bill that could have been built by a few legislators in a room. It required a diverse coalition, statewide meetings, uh, and continued conversations. Last year in the other body, this bill received 12, I believe 12, maybe 11 hearings uh, and uh, was moved to the floor. Uh, we didn't get any hearings here in the Senate, though we had this bill. Um, we could have discussed it if we wanted to take it slow and have a conversation about it, um, but it didn't get a hearing. And so now, uh, the people of Minnesota have heard about this bill for two years. They've watched hearings on the bill. They've watched the bill progress and move and grow and reflect changes. We're still doing that. And when you set up a brand new industry and a brand new agency, those decisions and changes aren't all going to be made by day one. Some of them will happen down the road as we learn more, as we continue to grow. Um, but 
just in the Senate then, uh, since I received this bill the first week of January and started carrying it, um, I have taken well over 100 meetings uh, in with stakeholders all across the board on this um, who have provided input, have shared their stories. Um, not, not all of them support cannabis legalization. I've taken a lot of hard, difficult meetings, and we've found common ground in some places. We've agreed to disagree in others. Um, but this bill has been a thoughtful, careful process uh, that a, an entire coalition of people has been working on for multiple years. Thank you, Senator Port. Members, questions. Senator Curran. Madam Chair, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Port, um, I, I, I have challenges, as you know, with many parts of the bill. To me, I, I appreciate the, I'm hoping the preservation of the med medicinal cannabis uh, program. Um, I don't have comfort in those that who will then regulate after, uh, as the years go on. Um, but we do need it, and we need it in this form that it's at. Um, and so I, I appreciate that. The recreational cannabis piece of it, I, you know, I'll, I'll never vote for that piece of it. I would never do that. Um, but I also think that if it's going to be there, it should be in an environment that's, we have enough um, regulatory components that uh, between alcohol or intoxicating substances as well as tobacco and, and all of those that are age-related or should be adult use, anything, and I don't see the, the merging of those. It appears that we're creating a whole new process for enforcement. And the piece that I struggle with is we're going to create another enforcement arm for the oversight and remove it from the local municipalities. And to me, that just means there'll be no enforcement. And maybe that's the goal. Um, but that's, I think, what's going to happen. There isn't a, a, a task or a police force or whatever size this agency is that's going to run it large enough to cover the 857 cities or, or the thousands of locations that will likely be covered under that governance between the medicinal, right? They'll be there for that and the recreational and as well as the hemp products. And so, I, you know, I think that should have been, we should have kept statute where it is and kept the enforcement where it is, create the packaging, marketing, and the policies from a testing so they can do those things, whether it be in-state, out-state, whether it be a, a, a brick and mortar facility or any of the products that are still going to attempt to come in via the internet. I know we can reach out and touch them, uh, anything mailed into this state. And, but to me, that's where that agency could focus on from an enforcement because that is out of the hands of a local enforcement to, to, to tackle them. But I, I just don't like that we, we are not building upon the local enforcement and neutering those that are interacting with everybody on a daily basis. So no state agency is going to even come close to doing anything effective besides on a complaint-based perspective, maybe random spot checks, but it's just going to be minuscule and ineffective. So to me, that's, that's a real big failure of the bill. The other part I do appreciate, though, is your, your willingness to uh, um, preempt local, local uh, um, local municipalities. I, I don't, you guys, I, I never got that kind of support when I, was, when I had bills to preempt uh, cities and counties. I got my friends in the back. Um, so with that in mind, I would like to move an, an amendment. I have the A105 amendment to the, uh, um, what is it, the Senate file 73. Senator Coran moves the... Well, the amendment that he's going to move. A105. The A105. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Coran. And we're going to get that distributed uh, to members, including the bill's author. Senator Coran, would you like to describe your amendment? Yep, Madam, thank you, Madam Chair. It's very simple. If you go to page 34, line 25, it says delete not. And what that does is it's uh, the actual text is a local unit of government may not prohibit the establishment or operation of a cannabis uh, licensed business under this chapter. And it just removes the not. And, uh, and then it also on line 34 line, or I'm sorry, page 34 line 20, it deletes everything after business. And then on line, uh, page 34, line 20, it deletes everything before the period. And so what this does is it, it really does restore local control so they can actually determine what goes in their business. I'm not sure um, if there is 
I'm not sure there are many other, maybe the, that somebody could find out, but what other entities has the state stepped in and decided that a local unit of government um, can or must accept, must accept a particular type of business? I don't know if somebody, if, if our municipalities, give me a head nod back there. There are none, is what I'm getting back from the, uh, uh, from the experts in the back row. Um, there are none. And so I find it really interesting. We have the dichotomy of bills coming through this legislature that are, legislature that are looking to ban flavored anything, tobacco, whatever it is, for, um, for adult use products. And in this case, um, in a, for cannabis and or any of the others that were saying you must accept these. I just find it amazing that this is the product that we're forcing. We're not, we're not forcing healthy food stations or we're not forcing people to exercise yet to be healthy in a community. But for cannabis, I find it amazing that we're going to consider and most likely mandate what cities and municipalities must accept from a business criteria or perspective. And we go into, that goes into long-standing practices of spot zoning, you know, is, if they can do it, can they do it anywhere? We can't spot zone commercial. We, we, I've been on a planning zoning commission. You just can't do that. But in this case, unless it's solar panels, you can put that visual blight anywhere. Uh, <laughs> but in this case, I find it extraordinary that we're even considering it. So I think we'd like to honor and I'd like to keep my friends in the cities and townships uh, and, and counties until I come up with my preemption bill. And I would hope for all, I'll have the support from everybody here. Um, but it really just brings the local control back. And, and I really do think um, this isn't what our people want. To, they want the local control. And I think they deserve it. So I urge a green vote and I request a roll call. A roll call. It's been requested. Roll call will be granted. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Coran. Um, to the A105, I asked members for a no vote. Um, the reasoning on this, and we have had many, many conversations with the cities and counties, and we'll continue to work with them to give them as much level of local control as is possible. But what we've learned from the other states that we have been working with is that the places where prohibition continued, where counties or cities ruled no cannabis was allowed, um, either through their city or, or county uh, restrictions. That is where it, was, it really uh, led to increases in the illicit market. Uh, it was sort of a sign saying, there's no legal market here, so there's a market. Um, this is where you want to set up. And what we are really trying to do with this bill, and yes, I know we won't be 100% successful, but we are trying to take the lessons from all of the 22 states who've come before us on what has worked to be effective at stamping out the illicit market, what has not worked, what has worked to keep uh, cannabis out of the hands of children, what has not worked. Um, and one of the strongest principles uh, and conversations that we've had with legislators is that when you allow pockets for prohibition to continue, it gives a foothold to the illicit market. And so for that reason, I ask members to vote no. Thank you, Senator Port. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Port, have you thought about, I had a city come to me and their suggestion was that you issue them a certain number of licenses like they do for alcohol. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna vote for this bill either, but you know, certainly it's something that I think the public is split about whether or not um, it should happen. And uh, I would expect and suspect if this, um, if this law, when and if it becomes law, um, takes place, that eventually at some point, that's probably where we're gonna end up. Why not go there now? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Duskowski. Uh, that is essentially what the A103 that we took up earlier did. It puts in dual licensing uh, for dual registration for uh, cities and counties, which gets to that enforcement piece that we were talking about before, allows them a level of enforcement uh, to pull that, which would immediately stop the business until uh, any you know, illegal selling or, uh, you know, regulation 
issues are fixed, and it also adds in a limit to retail licenses based on population. Those numbers were brought to us by the cities and counties and requested uh, that they put in. They mirror very closely uh, with the alcohol, uh, the same sort of sliding scale based on population. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Senator Port, that's quite a bit different, though, than the city actually issuing the licenses in the first place. Um, that has basically given them the ability to, I think maybe you or someone described later, to pull back or retract somebody who is a bad actor, but um, it doesn't give them the authority to decide who gets them in the first place. So that's quite a bit different, but it's, it's closer to there than maybe where the bill was at originally. Thank you. Senator Coran. Madam Chair, quick, quick follow-up. And Senator uh, Port, you, you spoke about the, the need for the to force a uh, type of business because of safety for children and to keep the, from the experience, keeping out of hands of children. So along that line then, uh, what are the requirements so the children don't have access in the home to the, now the new limit of five pounds, which is a fairly sizable amount of cannabis. Um, do we have a special safe requirement or storage requirement for them? And then how do they, how would that change from the grow operation in your own personal home from the safety and security of children. We're protecting them from the black market under this burdensome law to force a city, but at the same time, we just open it up to everybody can grow it everywhere in their backyard and in their home, um, which provides great access to young teens and young children in every neighborhood. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and Senator Coran. There are uh, multiple provisions in this bill that require for childproof packaging um, on cannabis, uh, which is on cannabis sales, including cannabis beverages. Uh, so that is one of the things we have been taking into consideration. There's not a requirement to uh, safely store your cannabis uh, at this point, and I would imagine that that would be a hard sell, but... Uh, we have worked significantly with uh, both poison control um, and uh, the medical professionals through the state, and what they said most was warning labels on packaging and uh, childproof packages were most helpful. Madam Chair. Senator Senator Port, and, and, and we agree on a commercial, on a retail product, but we're now expanding it. Everybody can get what, grow whatever they want, have whatever they want, and keep it wherever they want, and that's safe for the children. But having a licensed or not having it in our, in our backyard or not having a business is somehow more hazardous than having it in everybody's home. Um, I just don't uh, think that is, a, is an analog analogous to safety. When it is retail, I agree, right? With the CBD and not packaging, not marketing to kids. But, but we can store five pounds of it with our children in our home and grow, what, up to eight plants in your backyard or in your basement. And that somehow is then safe. I'm not sure. It, it doesn't correlate. So I think we should uh, restore uh, local control. Vote green. Madam Chair. Senator Port. Thank you. Um, if I may, to that last point, I, I will just say I've drawn this comparison before. Um, I am allowed legally to have an entire basement uh, wine cellar if I want. Um, and there are... At this point, uh, no deathly overdoses to cannabis. There are many people who have died from consuming too much alcohol, um, yet we don't police how much you can have in your home. You can homebrew beer. Uh, your children can probably get access to that. I'm guessing it's not stored in a lock safe. Um, so I, I would draw that same analogy um, and understand that it's a, it's a complicated uh, question as well. All right. Thank you, Senator Coran. Are there further questions before we take a vote on the A105? Senator Coran has moved the A105. He's requested a roll call. For those who are remote, I'd like you to turn your cameras on for the vote. So, there you go. Hi, Senator McQuaid, and hello, Hattie. Um, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Murphy? No. Vice Chair Mitchell? No. Senator Anderson? Yes. Senator Barr? 
Aye. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Swazinski? No. Senator Raskowski? Aye. Senator Fate? No. Senator Gustafson? No. Senator Jasinski? Senator Coran? Yes. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McQuaid? No. Senator Morrison? No. There being five ayes and eight noes, the amendment is not adopted. Members, do you have further questions? Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Port, um, Article 13, Section 7 of the state constitution says any person may sell or peddle the products of the farm or garden occupied and cultivated by him without <laughs> obtaining a license, therefore. How do you square up the fact that you've built all kinds of big government and licensures into this bill? I'm suspecting, if I read it again, uh, for people who grow this stuff as well, how do you square that up with the state constitution? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Draskowski. Madam Chair, I believe you uh, answered a significant chunk of questions around the same thing in the Agriculture Committee. Um, what I will say, and then I'll pass it to my expert, is that we regulate all sorts of things that you grow. Uh, you can't sell raw milk. Um, we have made health and safety decisions on things that need to be regulated. Um, there has been numerous points raised today uh, by members of this committee that cannabis is very dangerous. Uh, so we are you know, looking to address some of those health and safety concerns uh, through regulation. And I'll see if Ms. Fatehi wants to add more. Fatehi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members. Uh, Senator Draskowski, I don't have much to add on top of this. This is a constitutional provision that um, a, has been litigated in the past, and there are, as Senator Port pointed out, things that are grown that we impose a variety of different regulations on, and that has passed constitutional muster in this state. This perhaps may again be litigated in the context of this. We've consulted with constitutional attorneys on the constitutionality of this, and we feel comfortable that it passes muster. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Port. So does the bill require that if a person wants to grow this and sell it, that they have to petition the government for a license? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, if you want to sell cannabis, uh, you need a license. You are allowed to grow and give away uh, small portions, but if you want to sell cannabis, uh, you need to be licensed. Senator Jaskowski. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Port, well, on its face, it appears to be a direct conflict with the state constitution. I mean, I just read it. Uh, um, maybe there's not a lot of value that people have in that provision. I, I don't know, but um, it seems pretty clear. I think we might be setting setting you up for, uh, or you might be setting Minnesota up for uh, uh, one or more lawsuits here. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions? Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Port, I have a couple of questions. Sure. And I'm sure you can help me out here. So, and I don't know if this is, if we can actually ask this or not specifically, but in at the very end of the bill, it's got the appropriations for all the different pieces. And I know a couple of those pieces belong in this committee, uh, the court system, or we've got, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the uh, new cannabis board is going to be funded by this system and then the overall, and you've got complete open dots, no appropriations money in there. What is the plan or what is the intention? Wait to finance when you're done with all the committee stops? Can you just walk me through that, please? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Barr. Essentially, yes. Uh, we are at this point still waiting on the fiscal note. Uh, so it is difficult to put in numbers that we don't, uh, we don't yet have. 
Um, the plan is to put them to hold the bill uh, prior to finance until we get that fiscal note. If we don't have it by that point, um, we still got a couple couple more committees to go before that um, to add them in finance. Um, and I also have the assurance from leadership in both the House and the Senate that this will not come out of individual targets, um, that it is coming out of a leadership target. Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have uh, another question. Thank you for the answer. Um, uh, where did I lose that one at? Too many notes here. Uh, 198. So on the bill itself, 198.13 through 16, it's limitations of cannabis testing. And I'm kind of curious, the way I'm reading that, you can't actually test somebody unless it's required by law to test. And then if you came up with a positive test or I couldn't refuse somebody, I'm just kind of curious because there's a lot... Um, there are places that it may not be required by state or federal law to do pre-employment drug testing now, and they currently do that. They want to know who they're hiring, and it's just a company policy, but it's not required by law. Does this preclude them from doing that? They just have to knock that out now? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Barr. Um, it, I, I would say a couple of things I want to flag on it. Yes, essentially, um, with the caveat that there in this bill also puts a um, definition for a safety sensitive position, uh, which would be included in the allowable to be tested along with, uh, you know, if you have a job under federal law that requires for testing, things like that. Um, and so safety sensitive positions are jobs in supervisory or management in which impairment caused by drug or alcohol would threaten the health or safety of a person. There's also a limit or allowable uses for people who care for children, people who work in healthcare, um, things like that, in, uh, that, that are also allowed to have random testing. Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Port. One more question here. And um, I'm, I'm, I was looking at all the license fees. And some of those license fees seem pretty exorbitant, uh, specifically for the cultivator. Um, if I read that right, the initial is $10,000, a first renewal is twenty, dollars and then subsequent renewals after that are $30,000 a year. And then somewhere else here, in the, back a little further in the bill, it says that a bulk cultivator can only have 30,000 square feet of uh, canopy space, and plant canopy. Well, 30,000 square feet is just slightly over an acre. So we're basically charging folks, I don't know, a buck, an eight, buck a square foot, buck, a little over a buck a square foot for a license to grow. Um, by the time we have all the taxes that are the the regular the, the normal taxes in here, you know, sales tax, things like that, and then a tax for um, cannabis tax on top of that, and uh, just normal business, uh, you know, you have to pay employees, you have to pay property taxes, you have to pay other regulatory fees, you have to buy gas for the tractor, whatever it is, you have have fees to uh, just expenses to run a business. I'm kind of curious how we're going to drive the black market out when we're charging that much, uh, that much to uh, actually get product to market. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Barr, and I appreciate that we talked about this briefly earlier. Um, this is. This puts us much more in line with how licensing fees are done with the alcohol uh, industry, um, which is an opportunity as we've been talking with the cities and counties about potential uh, forms of revenue sharing. This is one that has been suggested and requested uh, as an option. We, we kept, keep them low on the early side um, to allow for people to come into the business, um, but we move it up then uh, as businesses take hold. To your point about, you know, one acre, one acre is assumed to be about $2 million worth of product. Uh, it is a significant, uh, you know, input of product. 
And we also raised the bulk canopy spaces in the amendment as well up to 45 or 60. I can't remember which. I'm sorry? Either 45 or 60. I'll look it up and get back to you. Um, those are considerations. Uh, we've, we've continued to have this conversation and uh, the renewal fees, we didn't want to increase a licensing fee or a registration fee right off the bat because that would keep out uh, people who might not have a lot of startup money. Um, but as they're getting into the industry, that was a place where we felt uh, the possibility of increasing those fees to help pay for enforcement and services. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Barr. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Port, uh, has a local impact statement been requested for this bill? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Senator Murphy and Senator Anderson. Yes, uh, we filled out the questions uh, for the local impact statement a um, month or so ago. Um, I haven't seen anything about it since then. Nothing, nothing to report back? Not, not at this point, no. Nope. We were asked to answer some questions, and uh, we did that, and I have not heard anything about it since. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Does this bill have uh, any consequences on the federal level as far as the, uh, the uh, dormant commerce clause? I will let our expert take that one. Ms. Fatahi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, Senator Anderson, uh, insofar as we're talking about the adult use products, um, there are no dormer, dormant commerce clause issues because these are not federally legal products and this is creating an intra-state market, so we're not talking about products that would be put into interstate commerce in the first place such that it would create um, uh, an unfair advantage for, for Minnesota um, businesses. With respect to the hemp market, um, the bill um, creates the where products are federally legal under the farm bill. It allows for them to continue to move about through normal means of interstate commerce. There are um, some restrictions in the bill uh, pertaining to importation, but those are very specific to the context of uh, products um, that are either manufactured or marketed for consumption as edible products. Uh, no cannabinoids, hemp derived or otherwise, are approved by the FDA as uh, approved food additives, um, and so those Restrictions again, because these are not products that, for the purposes of, of you know, be, of, as food additives, are not federally legal. Um, we don't have dormant, dormant commerce clause issues there either. So, in those situations where dormant, dormant commerce clause would would operate, um, the bill doesn't get a file of those. So, Madam Chair, Senator Anderson. So, Senator Port, uh, to your testifier, this bill can be exclusive to Minnesota and not have to be worried about outside uh, interests coming in. Ms. Fatehi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Anderson. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, um, when you're saying other interests from out of state coming in, I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question. Uh, what kind of interests in coming in to do Well, what? similar to what Senator happened Anderson. in New York State, where they tried to make it exclusive to New, the, city, the state of New York. Uh, they were basically shut down because of that. They had to open it up for uh, other interests coming out of the, out of the, you know, that wanted to be a part of the market in New York State. It, our bill, from what I can see, is basically for the state of Minnesota. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Anderson. Senator Anderson, um, what I will say about this is we're doing everything we can in the bill to make it. Uh, an industry that we are standing up here in Minnesota that works for Minnesota businesses and the people of Minnesota to get into this industry and stand it up. Um, part of what we've done is, uh, you know, having the grant and training programs be people uh, focused on people from 
Minnesota um, who have we have census tract information uh, and various ways of, of trying to ensure that it is local people. Uh, we do have to be careful of saying there is a residency requirement because that is what got the language in New York thrown out. Um, and we don't want to hold up the, the building of this. The other thing, the other reason, uh, you know, to Senator Barr's point about the, the high end of um, canopy size being 45 to 60 square feet, um, that's not a lot compared to some of the other states. But what we've seen in other states is as soon as you get close to that 100, uh, a mark of about 100 square feet, that is when it is profitable uh, for the big guys to just drop in and set up shop. Um, and so we are trying to keep away from that to try to de-incentivize uh, folks from coming in and just trying to soak up the whole market right away. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Anderson. Senator Swadzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Port, I just, um, I've been here seven years. I don't know how many more years I will continue to be here, but I do know this. There is never going to be another senator that has done as much listening and compromising and accepting of other viewpoints. I don't know how many pages this was when you first started, but I'm, um, kudos to you for, um, for everything that you've done to put this together and um, listening to all the stakeholders on every side of every single issue. Um, I do have three quick, um, the, um, and you know this because um, I've brought this up to you whenever we've talked, but my goal from day one has been just get it out of the hands of the bad guys. And when I've talked to other people, in other states that have legalized it, their, their issue was that the state regulated it and taxed it and had so many fees that um, the bad people could still undersell the state. And so, um, so the whole notion of, um, of um, taking it out of the hands of the bad guys didn't work out, and so people are, were going and buying fentanyl lace, and, you know, things in that, in, that were in the product that um, caused further harm um, to the user. And so um, I don't know if we've done that, but I know you've tried, and so um, I hope that we do this right in Minnesota. I do have three comments about the bill specifically, and I'm not expecting anybody to go, but on page 187, um, um, that uh, must allow a parent or because uh, I read carefully the education program um, and what kids are going to be taught on page 186 and 187 and and, and on line um, 14 of 187 I, I don't whenever I see that that parents are allowed to opt out of what we think is important curriculum um, I, I just I don't know and I know it's in there, and you probably listened to somebody that said um, it, I'd, I'd vote for this bill if there was an opt-out clause for, for parents. But boy, that's just, um, whether it's sex ed or, or um, the, uh, some other controversial subject, and here again, uh, another controversial subject that we're just trying to educate people um, of all the dangers on page 186 and to allow kids to opt out or allow parents to allow, I don't, just doesn't sit well with me. But, um, and then on page 170, um, oh boy, whoever comes, um, this and another issue that you and I have talked about is um, some young entrepreneur out there, scientist, STEM, um, tech young um, child is going to come up with a uh, um, uh, a, a, a device to determine on the road that you are impaired and whoever comes up with that invention is going to be a, a millionaire because that's every state that's legalized it. that's one of their biggest concerns is we don't have a, a reliable accurate test um, for impairment and that you put in this bill uh, um, uh, a 
a pilot project to help uh, um, somebody out there to figure out um, a device or a, whatever that product may be. To, to I, I just want to thank you for that because that's been in the other states um, the biggest a big concern of theirs. And then on page 109, sorry, um, but thank you again, Center Port, for this. And on page 109, my last comment. Oh, that's just silly on my part. Um, <laughs> But the, the labeling, oh my God, is the package going to have to be this big <laughs> to include all the requirements of the label? Um, so that's just um, not meant for any retort by you. It was just a funny thought in my little head at 7 o'clock at night um, when I saw that passage. Thank you, um, thank you again, Senator Port, for all of your work. And I hope um, Minnesota, I think you said earlier today, 22 states have legalized it. I hope we become the model based on all of your work and the work of others too, that um, we did it right and we took our time to get it right. And, um, and I wasn't a big fan at first, but um, I've come to see um, that maybe this is the best thing for the people in Minnesota. So thank you for everything. Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Poit, this is uh, along the lines of uh, Senator Barr's questioning on the testing side, it looks like you prohibit it. What's the, because a lot of it, um, employers are, are concerned about impairment. Yes, they, you know, in, in case of it, it, it's always good when you're not using, but, or you are using and the, your coworker drives over your foot and you both go get tested. And, uh, and those will present issues, but most of those are driven by the insurance industry. So I haven't heard anything. What's the insurance industry's position on this? And does this put our businesses at risk for being uninsurable because of that criteria based on the type of business and being, not being able to test for a specific intoxicating substance when they previously did? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Coran. Um, I've spoken extensively with uh, the insurance industry. That concern has not been raised to okay. me um, in any of their questions. Um, you know. Much like, uh, well, unlike alcohol, uh, cannabis stays in your blood for Very days, good. weeks, months. Very rare. Um, and so being able to test for it, we don't have a way to test for whether you are impaired in the same way that we do for alcohol. Um, I also don't believe there are a lot of employers out there who test for, who have you take a breathalyzer when you get to work. Um, they may have rules against intoxication um, and may have random drug testing, but for legal substances, uh, there's, it's not really the, the employer's, uh, you know, I guess, choice to make on whether they can ban an employee from using a legal substance off work time. Um, you still can't your, your employer can still have restrictions and rules around you being impaired at work um, and can send you home or fire you for being impaired at work, but you, um, you cannot be just forced to be tested for a legal product uh, that can stay in your system for many weeks. Thank you, Senator Part. Yeah, I've, I just hadn't heard the conversation yet, and of course all of those things are, are greatly intertwined. Um, we got enough you know, fees and regulations coming on our businesses. Um, in, we don't need their insurance rates to go up because of something like this. Um, help, Madam Chair. Senator Coran. Follow up right, on, on different subjects. So help me understand, I, I, the, uh, I'm looking at this, uh, the division of social impact or the ombudsman and the division of social equity. And it just seems interesting that that would be the title of the group that's going to issue the grants and investigate complaints and facilitate dispute resolutions. It seems like a business function and, and a law would dictate that you impose the law or enforce the law equally, right? Senator Port. Thank you. Uh, Senator Curran, can you point me to the page that you're speaking I, of? I don't have the it's page. Um, it's the office of the the ombudsman on social, um, the social impact and, you know, it'll be administering the grants um, to the communities that have disproportionate uh, negative impact from cannabis prohibition. Senator 
Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Coran. Um, I'd be happy to change the name if you have a different well, name. <laughs> it just seemed, I mean, I, I get it. You've already, it, it, I, the newest terms and the, it, it's unending here. Um, but we've got these, uh, the zones that you're talking about, disproportionate and negative impact from cannabis prohibition. So administering grants in those communities. Where are those, are those communities spread all over Minnesota? Senator, and is there a map? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Coran. Um, I don't have a map, but I'll look into it and see uh, what we have uh, and be happy to send that to you. Um, they're primarily uh, in a lot of in a lot of ways, uh, though I will say they span both urban and rural, um, but they tend to be communities of color um, because they have been significantly over-policed uh, and over-prosecuted on cannabis. Uh, white Minnesotans and black Minnesotans use cannabis at roughly the same rate, yet a black Minnesota Minnesotan is more than four times as likely to be prosecuted for that, to be arrested for that, to be prosecuted, and to be convicted. Um, so there is direct harm and direct correlation uh, to those communities that have been just significantly impacted uh, by our culture of prohibition and the over-policing of it. Madam Chair, Senator, 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 Senator Port, so along those lines, so is this, is it a defined set of criteria? Because you've already laid out, um, you've, in, the, in the bill it states that there, there's a limited number based on population. Does that limit apply to those areas, areas that are, that are um, disproportionately negatively impacted by over-prosecution? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Cran. The local units of government in those places would be able to put those same restrictions in okay. if they so desired. Madam Chair, Senator, Senator Port. Coran. What if that doesn't meet the equity goal? Then what do you do? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Coran. Uh, I, I imagine that the board would look at uh, fluctuating licenses. Uh, I don't know what that would look like. Uh, we have many guidelines for them to work with and also give them variances uh, to, as we adopted earlier today, to, to make the best choices possible when we weren't able to specify specific uh, potential hypothetical situations in the bill. Well, well Madam Chair. Senator uh, Coran. Senator Port, it, you're gonna be picking winners and losers and so, to have some defined criteria. That's why I asked, if there's a region, how are you gonna apply? And it'd be arbitrary at best if there's not a defined area. Um, you described the, where I grew up. And so when you apply the standards, and it'd be great if they're equal to all, and, and get everybody ex, uh, equality, the opportunity, heck yeah, everybody's for that, always. Um, but it just seems very broad in the composition of everybody here. It'll be a, a, a very exclusive cr group and, and we're always concerned issuing grants. We don't do grants very well today, period, in any aspect from Department of Human Services, any, any, any level of government. Those on the groups awarding, it typically appears to be self-fulfilling or they have some direct correlation and relationship to uh, a financial uh, gain, either a direct family member or many times uh, themselves. And so those are the issues that are gonna cause, even when you're doing, trying to do good things, you're gonna create doubt and, and lack of trust. So to me, that's the part that, I, I don't know how you can do it with the, with the structure that's there. It looks like it's designed exclusively to exclude randomly without defined criteria. And with the structure of another state agency, it's not gonna function any more effectively than any other state agency that we have in the state. And so to me, that's the biggest piece. Um, the transparency in the grant process Criteria must be established up front, and it must be applied equally across the board. Even in the very communities you're talking about, you're not going to be able to apply it equally. And then what? And that, so that criteria better be very thorough and very well defined, and then the, the transparency and oversight in those, in those processes um, we'll have to work hard, right? That's, uh, uh, if you follow what we're doing in the OLA, it's a big gap and, and we need that oversight and we need to make sure that the background checks are done, conflicts of interest, all of those things have to be done. And I'm not sure anybody's 
prepared to do that today. So those are the things that uh, you and I can continue to work on. But you're going to exclude. And, and you see it already today. They're going to go out and, I'm not included. Where's my equity? And then what? And then you can change the rules randomly without the legislature. Those are the things I'm concerned about. And so those things have to be well-defined in, in well-defined criteria or in the best of intentions, it's not going to work. And, and you're going to have the very community you claim to, that they're going to be trying to help, um, be bat they're going to battle within themselves for that piece of the pie. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Cran. Senator Port. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. We've got two pretty small items. Senator Port, on um, page 52 on line 23, uh, there may be a typo there. Um, Senator Draskowski, are you on the bill or the amendment? I'm on the amendment. Okay, I'm sorry, thank you. Madam Chair. The new language. Article 1. Page um, 52. Line 23 says 30,000 30, cubic feet. I believe it was intended to say square feet. Senator Jaskowski is on page 52, line uh, 23. Correct, Madam Chair. Of the amendment. That's right. We're talking the difference between square feet and cubic feet. Senator Report. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dreskowski. Uh, that is to allow for a smaller footprint, but uh, tiering. That is um, how they tier it. So, so Senator Report, um, you know, if you read that subdivision, uh, it says a cannabis cultivator may cultivate up to 15,000 square feet, and then the office can, by rule, increase that limit to a maximum of no more than 30,000 square feet is, I believe, what you want to say there. Square feet is the area in which they can grow it. Cubic feet would be, would include, would be, would it be a, a measure of volume? It, it would be, you can go. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair <laughs> and Senator Skowski. It would be that you can tier the layers and have multiple layers. Okay, then, then Senator Port, well. you want to make the first one cubic feet as well on line 52.21. They should be the same um, depending on whether you want to measure area or volume. Senator Port, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dreskowski. Um, we are, it sounds like council is already looking uh, at this and pulling together conformity on that. I, I believe the intent is to switch them all to cubic, uh, but uh, council is finding all of the instances of that to ensure conformity throughout the bill. Okay, just want to help you with your bill. I appreciate that. Senator Thank you, Port. Senator Jaskowski. <laughs> not, not really, but at least we'll, we'll have a read right. Um, Senator Port, page 16. Um, you do say that the director of this brand new agency, big agency from what I can tell, Office of Cannabis Management, and I appreciate this provision, um, says the director can't for two years after, after serving as director and after serving director for two years cannot have financial interest in a cannabis business or hemp business license under the chapter. There's no consequences there. So. The guy or gal leaves two years later, they're a year and a half down the road and they're discovered to be, uh, have shares in a hemp business or, or a cannabis business. So what? Uh, can we have a penalty there for them? Let's say like uh, two years salary fine uh, or uh, uh, private cause of action to sue for such. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Draskowski. I would. Sorry to put you on the spot, but ask council if there are other places where we are limited, uh, you're limited from becoming agency directors or various things after being a legislator, um, or things like that. Are there penalties in any of those cases? I know right now, Senator Port, that 
for instance, uh, the prohibition that has been placed in rules, at least in the House, about lobbying after serving the legislature have no penalty. Um, I also know this committee or this bill is going next to judiciary, where you may have um, an, a real opportunity to talk about uh, penalty. Um, and not to cut you off, Senator Draskowski, because I think you are talking about uh, not criminal, a necessarily criminal penalty, but penalty. But I do, I do want to flag that it's going to that committee next. And maybe I'm filling time just a little bit in case council wanted to do a little looking at something before we call well, on just, them. Well, Madam Chair, I just wanted to offer the idea to the author. Um, so, Senator Port, I mean, when you get down the road with this and it gets into law, then it gets to be more difficult because there's personalities involved. Now you're at the point of formation here, which you know very well the way it sounds. Um, <laughs> Um, but now would be the time to put in some consequences. We, we don't, I mean, this is a really good idea to have that in there, but there's no teeth. And I, I don't know what the consequence should be, but it, there, there's an opportunity to put in there. And there might be other areas in the bill to do the same. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Port. All right. Members, uh, I think we're coming close to a vote. Uh, yeah, and I'm seeing nodding heads. Senator Report, uh, I, I know, and people have talked to you, I know how much work you've done, um, you and others have done uh, on preparation of this bill. I know you started this at the opening talking about wanting to legalize, regulate, and expunge. Um, and I understand uh, from my perspective the purpose of that. Uh, the district that I represent when I first ran for office many years ago, college campuses, they were pushing for this legislation then. Um, on the same college campus at St. Kate's, it's at Carondelet Village, really worried about it. Um, and uh, I will say that in the district I represent, as I have continued to talk with people, uh, the pushing and the concern have grown narrow. Um, and I think that is a signal that you are making real headway on this piece of legislation. So I do want to thank you for that, as many others have done so before. Is there anything more you want to say uh, before we uh, take a vote? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank the committee members for your time and insight. Uh, Senator Draskowski, I will look into that and, and look at bringing it up for judiciary. Um, and Senator Swazinski, I want to uh, particularly point out on the comments you made about the pilot project, I think we have the smartest kids here in Minnesota. I think they're going to be the ones to figure this out. Um, and so I, I share your, uh, your, your hope in uh, the future that we're building uh, and the ingenuity of Minnesotans. Uh, I think you're right, we will be the first. Um, and other than that, I just wanna thank members uh, for your time and consideration. I know this is a complicated issue. I'm happy, my door is always open. Um, and I am happy to continue talking about any concerns um, as this continues to move forward. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Roll call, please. A roll call has been requested. Roll call is granted. Uh, members who are remote, uh, can you please turn on your cameras for the vote? Uh, and as you're doing that, I'll thank Senator Pye. Excuse me, I'll, send, I'll thank Senator Port for the pie. <laughs> 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 the clerk will take the roll on Senate File 73. I move uh, that Senate File 73 be, uh, as amended, be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Now, the clerk, will, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Murphy. Aye. Vice Chair Mitchell. Aye. Lead Anderson. No. Senator Barr. No. Senator Carlson. Yes. Senator Swadzinski? Yep. Senator Draskowski? No. Senator Fate? Yes. Senator Gustafson? Yes. Senator Jasinski? Senator Curran? No. Senator Lang? No. Senator McQuaid? Aye. Senator Morrison? Aye. Aye. 
there being eight ayes and five noes, uh, seven, Senate file 73 is adopted or moved on. Uh, you're heading out. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Too long of a day. Uh, members, I just want to let you know that we uh, will meet on Thursday, uh, but just during the daytime hours. Uh, we don't plan to meet on Thursday evening because there are multiple committees meeting, but that does mean we will have one more hearing on a Friday. Uh, so please stay tuned uh, for your uh, for you to your email for the agenda. Uh, we will be taking up issues and taking votes, and you know soon we will be to that deadline, and, and we won't be doing that anymore. But I want to let people know. With that, uh, members, thank you very much for your time and attention. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.